Okay, so this is a good video for after you've already watched a video or learned about mitosis and meiosis. And so now we're going to compare and contrast the two processes of cell division. Uh, so first, let's go ahead and look at the general themes between um, these two types of uh, cell division. So first, mitosis is a process of division that is used to produce more somatic cells or body cells. And it's primarily used for growth and reproduction. So once a sperm fertilizes an egg, like, and now you are made of trillions of cells, all of those cells were produced by mitosis. Whereas meiosis is producing gametes or sex cells. And meiosis only happens in reproductive organs, uh, in like testicles or ovaries. Now in mitosis, the first cell you start with is a diploid cell. And at the end of mitosis, you end with two identical diploid cells um, to the parent cell, and then identical to the parent cell. And then in meiosis, the cell you start with is actually called a germ cell. Um, but that germ cell, that cell is a diploid cell. So it starts with a diploid cell, but now it's gonna actually undergo two rounds of division to end with four haploid cells. Now the daughter cells in mitosis are genetically identical to that parent cell, unless there's mutations, uh, but the daughter cells in meiosis are on purpose genetically different from that parent cell, and mitosis has one round of division where meiosis has two. Now, before either process can start, mitosis or meiosis, uh, there's gonna be interphase as part of the cell cycle. And in both uh, types of division, in S phase, the DNA is going to duplicate. So you will see those duplicated uh, chromosomes in both uh, mitosis as well as meiosis. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. So when we look at mitosis versus meiosis in prophase, in the very beginning of M phase, you can see how in mitosis uh, and meiosis here, in the cells I'm using, we are starting with six chromosomes. So in prophase, you can count your six chromosomes in mitosis. And then in meiosis, you can see there's also six chromosomes. But the difference here um, is that in meiosis one, in prophase one, there's going to be pairs form. So you can see how the chromosomes are um, like spread out differently. Now I do wanna say that in prophase, in both meiosis and mitosis, the nuclear envelope breaks down, the chromosomes condense, everything that you learned that happened in prophase still happens, but a major difference is that in mitosis, um, there are no pairs forming, whereas in meiosis one, um, prophase one, uh, there are homologous pairs that form tetrads. Now, this is also where crossing over happens. So this is a pretty important step in meiosis. So let's zoom in and talk about it a little bit more. So there's this process, like the actual scientific term for um, pairs forming, for the homologous pairs to find each other, is called synapsis. So homologous chromosomes undergo synapsis is like the coming together of those um, pairs. Now, uh, the location of where they actually cross over is called a chiasma. Plural would be chiasmata. Now, um, crossing over happens and you get that genetic shuffling. You get to exchange homologous genes and switch uh, the DNA. So again, to summarize the vocabulary words on this slide, you have synapsis, which is the pairing of homologous chromosomes that occurs during meiosis. Chiasma is the point of contact. Uh, where two, I love this definition, two non-homologous sister chromatids cross over. Um, so they're not like, they're on different chromosomes. I love that. And I do want to point out, yo, crossing over creates a brand new, never existing before a DNA sequence in this recombinant chromosome. So when you have the product of crossing over, like here, this chromosome is part paternal and maternal kind of, uh, this is a recombinant chromosome. And it's a, it's a sequence of DNA that has never existed on earth before. And it's a, a super important a source of genetic variation in, uh, in meiosis. Okay, so uh, to summarize again, here you have your homologous pairs. Then you have synapsis of them actually like 
like I always think about it as like zipping together and holding in place and stabilizing. So that way the actual like crossing over can occur. And then you have now your recombinant chromosomes. All right, so let's continue into uh, metaphase. So metaphase of mitosis, you can see how its individual chromosomes are lined up along the equator versus metaphase one. Oh, this is such an important step in meiosis as far as contributing, contributing, there you go, to variation in the offspring. So when we look at metaphase one in meiosis one, the homologous chromosomes, they pair up along the equator of the cell. So now let's go ahead and look, you can still see the uh, recombinant chromosomes. You can see the products of crossing over are still there. Now, this step here though, uh, increases variation in offspring. Now let me tell you why. So if we look at, this is just three chromosomes, right? Human, I mean, three pairs of chromosomes. In humans, we would have 23 pairs. So like here, if we talk about the pairs moving to the middle of the cell, you can see how there's different combinations possible. These pairs and how they move are like random. What side is gonna have the maternal chromosome? Which side will have the paternal chromosome? So when we look at this, this actually ties into Mendel's law of independent assortment. So the law states that alleles of two or more different genes get sorted into gametes independently of one another. So if we have like these alleles, these genes like A and B, and we have a dominant and we have recessive, you can see how the first cell compared to the second cell, when these eventually like separate and end up into gametes, uh, these alleles are not connected to each other. They're not linked. They're independent. A gamete or an offspring could inherit a dominant capital A and a lowercase b, or they could inherit a capital dominant A and a capital dominant B allele. Like these are um, independent of each other. And every time metaphase one happens, there are different possibilities. Now in humans with our 23 pairs, there are actually 8 million different ways that these pairs can assort along the middle of the cell. So this is a super important step in creating variation in the offspring, but I have it in a couple slides later on to help uh, emphasize it. So now let's go into anaphase. Now in mitosis, this is where your sister chromatids separate. But in meiosis, we had them lined up in pairs. So here in anaphase one, it's the pairs that separate. And this is important because um, this separation of pairs in meiosis one is what ensures that the gametes will receive a haploid set of chromosomes because now we have divided the like amount of DNA basically in half. So for example, in anaphase of mitosis, uh, when they separate, like there's six chromosomes on the left and six chromosomes on the right. However, in anaphase one at this step, there's three here and three here. So this is that beginning of now going from diploid into haploid. Is this anaphase one, we've lined all the pairs up and now it's time to divide them in half. Now, also remember, as we go to separate them, it depends like on how the pairs lined up, that you'll get different combinations at this point. We are now separating our uh, chromosomes and that will result in different possibilities of gametes. Okay, so then we go into the end of mitosis where you have telophase and cytokinesis. And you can see here that these two uh, cells are identical to each other. And they're both diploid. There are six chromosomes in each of, chromosomes, sorry, in each of these cells. Whereas here in meiosis, um, I do want to point out, oops, you can see this animation. Uh, at the end of cytokinesis, the chromosomes, they are in both, are going to uncondense into chromatin. Uh, however, it's easier if we actually are looking at these condensed chromosomes. So I just leave that here. But now when we look at meiosis one, at the end of meiosis one, our two cells, they are haploid. Look, yo, there's three chromosomes in each one. So we have successfully taken a diploid cell and divided it into two haploids, all because of metaphase one and anaphase one, when we paired them up and then divided them in half. 
But our issue is that these chromosomes are still duplicated chromosomes. And therefore, meiosis needs another round of division to separate these sister chromatids. So in meiosis two, and what we see is we have prophase two. Now these steps are very similar to mitosis. So here, this is where the chromosomes would condense, nuclear envelope breaks down, in metaphase two. Oh, look though, we also have two cells now because at the end of meiosis one, we had two cells. So now both of these cells are going through meiosis two. So then metaphase uh, two, it is not pairs anymore. Now it is individual chromosomes. They are duplicated, but it's the individual chromosomes lining up along the middle of the cell. And look, you can see the um, recombinant chromosomes from crossing over. And then in anaphase two, it's the sister chromatids that are going to separate, not pairs. And then we get into telophase and cytokinesis, where now we have four genetically different haploid cells. So I just want to touch on, now that we've seen meiosis two, I just want to go back to that independent assortment, where here we can see when the um, pairs line up, and then in um, meiosis two, how we have two cells after the pairs have separated. Look at these gametes. Now, truthfully, in this slide, I do not have recombinant chromosomes or the crossing over uh, because it just took way too long to do that uh, color changes and stuff. So pretend crossing over uh, is still a thing here, okay? Um, and then if you look at the second cell, look at when those pairs get separated, how the different combinations of chromosomes that end up in their gametes. Or look at the third option. So you can see that every time meiosis occurs, how these pairs line up will influence which chromosomes are passed on to the offspring, depending on which gamete fertilizes the egg. Okay, um, so, uh, oops, crossing over and independent assortment are super important sources of variation um, in sexually reproducing populations. So now this is my last slide as we compare and contrast the final products of mitosis and meiosis. So at the end of mitosis, uh, the two daughter cells are both diploid and identical to the parent cell that you started with and each other. Whereas in meiosis, uh, we have at the end of meiosis two, the second round of division, there are four cells. They are all haploid and genetically different from each other due to crossing over and independent assortment. So if you study those four cells, you'll notice no two are alike because of, now, okay, if we didn't have crossing over, like if we go back to this slide, like look at the, um, look over here on the left. If there was no crossing over, then two would be identical and these would be identical. But because of crossing over, um, there's actually uh, four genetically different cells. Like they all end up being different because of the products, the recombinant chromosomes from crossing over. All right, so that is it for me on comparing and contrasting mitosis and meiosis. And I really hope it was helpful for you. I enjoyed it.